Greetings, <clears throat> I'm Ann Krebs, and I'm here to talk to you about um, our master data management graph. Um, I work for uh, Lockheed Martin Space Systems. Our logo at space is, we do space. <laughs> so, we build a lot of super cool stuff, satellites. Um, we build the little uh, vehicles that you see driving around Mars. We spin things, send things throughout the galaxy. We visit asteroids. And so, super fun place to work. Uh, throughout my career, had numerous uh, different roles. I was a database developer, a software developer, uh, various uh, languages. I have designed uh, many a database and also several object models. I've managed a lot of people and also a lot of projects. Today I am a data engineer. Data engineering is kind of an emerging role uh, at our company. Um, we str struggle sometimes to figure out exactly what that job is. But primarily, we're responsible for uh, the data, the governance of the data, the management of the data. And more and more, as IT moves into a supporting role with the um, creation of uh, citizen developers and citizen data scientists, as we like to call them, um, our, we are more and more focused on making sure that we have great, good quality data we look for data from many different sources. Our job is to get it um, in a prepared and in architecture and provide access to that data. I'm also uh, the graph evangelist at Lockheed Martin. I spent probably the last three years uh, preaching the power of graphs to uh, organization, IT organizations and to um, the business area. So I'm a big, big fan. I am also uh, very fortunate to live in the state of Colorado. And when I was a little younger, I had this vision or this goal to walk the entire Colorado Trail. The Colorado Trail is a trail that runs from Denver all the way down to Durango. It uh, crosses over the Continental Divide several times. So it's daunting and like master data management, daunting, but not impossible. So we always had this genius plan. The way the Colorado Trail works is that you can access the trail at different points and you can park your car at it. So we'd always use two cars, leave one car at a trailhead, drive to the next one and walk to the first car. So this way, we could walk short segments and we could generally go downhill. Uh, we also had, besides their goal and our vision and our plan, we had a lot of pioneer spirit. So when you see the markings of the trails, it, we weren't uh, daunted by the uh, lack of information that this sign gives you. So with their vision, our plan and our spirit, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, unfortunately, we did not have the right tools for the right job. And this particular day, we happened to have terrible hangovers. So instead of walking downhill about 4,000 uh, feet and four miles, we ended up going nine miles uh, over a great distance and ended up in a town called Breckenridge that you might have heard of. They have some pretty great beer. Um, we were started over in South Park, and yes, it's that South Park. And so when we're in Breckenridge, we're trying to determine what's the solution. Do we rent a car, just get a hotel? My family was trying to figure out how to call search and rescue. But in the end, we decided we had to walk back up that dang mountain. And uh, halfway up that mountain, as we were sitting on the trail thinking we were going to die, just happened to see a rock that looked just like a tombstone. And that greatly uh, spurred me to finish that hike. And so what if we would have had a great tool, 
that would uh, uh, help us to make sure we were going the right direction. Now today, I wouldn't go to a different neighborhood if I didn't have my GPS. Shameless plug, Lockheed Martin Space is building the next generation of GPS satellites. But we all use that all the time. Certainly wouldn't go to another town uh, or to another state without GPS. So what about our business? If we had a great tool like that that always told us where we were going, would we use it? Uh, we're undergoing a digital transformation. We're all part of that. Um, all kinds of devices now collect information and can share that information. My dog has a chip on it in case it gets lost. Um, our homes are getting smarter and smarter. We all have thermostats that learn. We all have smart speakers, so no excuse for not knowing what the weather is. Um, and then industry is being transformed as well. So agriculture is really undergoing a transformation as well as energy and security markets and everyday things. I have this watch on my wrist that spies on me all day long and tells my phone everything. Our industry uh, at Lockheed Martin is really undergoing a transformation too with the uh, onset of Internet of Things and smart factories. So we have things now uh, like a Bluetooth torque wrench. So when a technician is putting parts together, this wrench tells them precisely how much torque to apply, but also records that information, and that information is shareable. We have uh, RFIDs on our bins now, so we could keep track of sets of parts. We have uh, machines that we can deliver CAD models to that do uh, 3D printing. So we are starting to 3D print a lot of parts and someday we'll probably be 3D printing large portions of satellites. We can also take those same CAD models and give them to machines that do our quality inspection. So it's much more precise to know if you got it exactly right than uh, a person performing that task. So if we have all this data, and now all the businesses really um, understanding the value of this data and want to use all this data, if we're not taking all this data and connecting it together, then we're really missing a big piece of the value because uh, the sum is much greater than the parts. So at Lockheed Martin, we too had a vision are a goal, and that was try to understand um, our entire business process, all the data that uh, we created. We call that our product DNA. Um, we have tons of highly paid, educated people who spend enormous amounts of time going to disparate systems and mining information and trying to put it together, and they do it every month. Now, the way they put this data is based on uh, their experience and um, also their opinion. And so we have problems where people have different opinions and they put the data together differently. So there really is uh, no truth in that. So we have super complicated systems and it's very expensive to build interfaces between those systems costs millions of dollars and uh, takes us years. And then because they're so complicated, there's problems with that. And so our vision, if we're only trying to combine data to be able to look at all of this data together holistically, then uh, we needed a better tool. So we had a plan. Our plan was to go to all these disparate data domains and look for data uh, that is key, the data that ties all of our systems together, the commonality between these different parts. And so we've labeled that as our master data. So we were going to take all these pieces of data, this master data, and map it to our process flow. 
We also wrap everything we do uh, it, with a lot of data governance and data protection. So being a defense contractor, that's really key. As we're collecting information about all of this, we're building uh, metadata repositories so that we can eas more easily find data. Uh, more interesting, we're, everything we do now is all wrapped in microservices. So we have a, a microservice catalog that is being developed that represents the data that we would pull from all these disparate systems. We call the graph our wide data and we call the microservice catalog and that set of microservices um, our deep data. So we had a plan, we had a vision. Uh, what could go wrong? Our data didn't look anything like that flow once we started working with it. But unlike our hike, this time we happened to have the right tool. And so as we mined our systems looking for commonality, we're able to start building communities of data. One thing I wanted to note, uh, well, our master graph, uh, although this is not our master graph, it looks very similar. One thing uh, that we do to be able to communicate to the business is try to color code our graph by domains so that they, they can understand the meaning of the graph. And we put engineering data in here, manufacturing data in here. We have our whole supply chain in here. We have uh, what happened in our quality uh, inspections and then also what happened in tests. We have a lot of external data added to this. Um, we have government spending data so we can understand more about our contracts. So not only who we're doing business with in the uh, government, but also who uh, our government is doing business with, those same agencies. We have a lot of information about our suppliers. So we have our supply chain, then we have to go externally to figure out who our suppliers are doing business with so we can get that complete picture and really be able to respond when you see a problem out with some supplier, what's the impact to my supply chain? It might not be in that first level. And so let me give you an example said once we started examining all those systems and looking for commonality, we could find evidence of our product or our parts in each one of those systems. And so when we start building that together, really what we're creating is a community of parts. And so you might hear that at the conference today, a community of objects and really determined that that is at the center of everything we do. Everything goes back to that part. And even though you know, we couldn't build a flow because of the constant interaction and cycles that really take place in our data flow, everything surrounded the, these parts. And so we can map it that way. Um, additionally, we go back and uh, mine all these different domains. We found several other communities of data. And knowing that the product is the center of everything we do, we could tie those communities of data all together uh, around this community of parts. So we found uh, lots of benefits many of them expected, some of them very unexpected. Once we had our data in a graph, now we had this roadmap to understand how our business worked and how it went together. Um, we also had a super handy tool for a data scientist to be able to use. Uh, graphs are very popular and have been for a long time for data scientists to be able to examine uh, complex relationships. So, they're quite grateful that we put that tool together for them. More importantly, we've now built this tool that everything can call to get the truth of how our data really fits together. Talked to you before about how um, we had uh, all these people across the business pulling data manually and putting it together in their opinion. 
Now we have <clears throat> one standard of truth and quality as to how this data really fits together. So everything we do going forward uh, will reference this graph. So we have more and more applications that are not specific for any one business area. Now they all need to know, uh, quality needs to know what happened in engineering. Had many talks with, uh, especially downstream organizations where uh, they always get blamed for problems and they want to be able to go see the entire picture so they can say, hey, that wasn't us. That was really engineering. <laughs> and to be able to tie that together. Said everything, uh, we're building all works on uh, microservices. And since this is combined and works with those, um, it all works pretty seamlessly together. Um, we had some new unexpected benefits arise that we weren't planning on. Yes, now we've created this entire DNA of our product. Uh, now what do we do with it? Well, we have uh, the opportunity to do root cause analysis in an entirely new way. Uh, before, you would have to spend two to three weeks trying to figure out what went wrong in a particular area. And usually, by the time you got the answer to that, uh, the, it was overcome by events. So we have people who are operating satellites in space. We have tons of telemetry data coming down. We have a machine learning uh, tool that reads all this telemetry data to try to detect anomalies earlier and earlier. These people who are operating satellites uh, do not know how to respond when they find a particular problem. People in operations speak much differently than engineering. So even if they were able to go back to all these systems and pull all the information surrounding these anomalies, they wouldn't necessarily understand what it meant. So we've tied uh, this tool back to our master data graph. So when people find anomalies very early in the operation of a satellite, they can now come see the complete picture of that, of that area of the product. They can see all of engineering and understand uh, who they might need to talk to and to get a better understanding. Also, they can look at that whole release to see if we had uh, multiple cycles on a particular part that might cause you to want to go look there earlier. They can do the similar thing with uh, all the test cycles to see if there was any indication of an early problem there. We tie it. Uh, back to quality so they can see if there was any problems found in inspection that were not completely resolved. We also have it tied to our supply chain and uh, tied to news. So when there's something in the news that said uh, something bad happened with the supplier, then that might be a place for them to be able to go look and do root cause analysis. So they can get this information super quickly right then no point in building a system where they can detect anomalies really early and then not give them a tool to be able to determine what that means. Um, another area we found some unexpected be benefits is the relationship between data that we didn't know exists. We've been working hard lately on an area called uh, trying to determine what the real cost of a product is. Part of that analysis is that you have to look at all those labor hours and to try to determine what was really rework or what was not rework to be able to get a full picture of what that looks like. So uh, on the surface, you simply think you could just tie that to your quality and see what kind of failures in inspection and reinspections, and look at those cycles. But in fact, we really store um, that rework data in up to eight different systems. And it all depended on the level of rework uh, to uh, what program we was using it. And so by mining now this uh, much bigger set of data, we have a much better feel about really what the cost of our product is. That entire tool was uh, built by, uh, manually by one finance guy 
based on his opinion, and yes, he would like to retire shortly. So it was really critical to be able to get all that information out of a tribal knowledge and get it in something that can be used by the generations going forward. Another unexpected benefit uh, was a, a level of influence. So it's much easier now to be able to say um, this influence of a part to another domain, but also even within a domain. We're trying to drive more and more uh, towards common products. Uh, for us at Space, we build generally one satellite at a time. So common products hasn't been a big deal, but now we've identified structures and our satellites that are repeated every time. So we want to move more and more towards a common products. And uh, so now we need to really understand the impact of when you change the design of the engineering, what that has on uh, all the programs that are trying to use that. Uh, interesting use case here, we took uh, all the parts, uh, the engineering parts for a rather large intergalactic spaceship and piped all of that into the system to try to determine what was the most important part in that whole system. You know, it's a lot of very complex uh, engineering that's going on in there, very sensitive uh, uh, instruments. And so it was very interesting for us to get all that in there to determine really what was the most critical part. So you could address risk, make sure that we have um, taking care of the that part before anything happens. Well, it turned out the most critical part in that large spacecraft of hundreds of thousands of parts is adhesive. So we would have never guessed that adhesive was the critical part to this tool without being able to put that in the graph. And now we can take that information and go back and look at our supply chain for that adhesive. Do we have multiple places to be able to uh, get that adhesive from? Are there any problems with those suppliers? How much stock do we have on hand? What's going to happen if the price of adhesive goes up? And so there's a lot of things that we can look at much earlier uh, than before and be able to be ready for risk. Now that we have all this data and graph, we can also look at it from different perspectives. Uh, the way we've been building our graph is to uh, have all of what we think are the master data represented from these domains, but we go to each area of the business and talk about the data and how they use the data and how it's related. So in a relational database, really all you're storing is constraints. Uh, graphs are much different. You really need to understand the questions they're trying to answer how they talk about the data, how they describe those relationships. So we go through and talk to each of these groups. We most frequently reuse those same primary communities of data or nodes and continue to add relationships or properties on those so that we can answer their particular questions. And so um, some of that has allowed us to do some an interesting analysis, uh, in particular cost-wise. So we have a big investment in trying to um, increase the complexity of our CAD models. That's called a DSR rating. So it costs a lot of money to get more and more complicated, and programs spend a lot of money. They write that into contracts. So we want to do interesting analysis to determine, is that really worth the investment? Is, uh, by comparing that engineering downstream to quality and over to test, did it really make things better? And it did. So it was a good um, way to be able to go validate that. We also do uh, impact analysis or location uh, based on our schedule. So if we have a hurricane hitting the Carolinas, we can look at our supply chain and our schedule to see what we're building there at that particular time so that we can respond more earlier uh, to what that means to our different programs and to that schedule. Uh, let me talk a little about my very 
favorite phrase, polyglot persistence. <laughs> polyglot persistence really just means, hey, let's use the right tool for the job. Uh, at Space, we have every flavor of database you can imagine, uh, even several NoSQL databases, um, lots of HANA, Oracle, Sybase, SQL Server, MySQL, you name it. Um, we have some pretty sensitive transaction systems that we're trying to protect their performance on. So we do have a data warehouse that we uh, replicate data to to uh, protect that performance. We have raw data stored in a lot of Hadoop environments. Uh, we also have what we call a virtual data lake. And that's that deep data I had talked about with all those microservices. And so we don't have to restore data in the future. We'll have access and a means to pull all of that together. Um, with the um, uh, up in the analytic layer, like I said, we record everything we're doing in a metadata catalog so we can describe the data. Um, all of these things work with this microservice platform. And so for the graph, we have probably billions of rows of data. And we don't want to take all that data and put it in the graph. We were very surgical about what we extract and what we store. We only take the data needed to tie our systems together and the data to describe these relationships and uh, that protects the performance of our graph, but it also makes our graph a lot easier to use. Uh, my favorite data scientist worked at a company where they really uh, loved graphs. They just got graphs. They shoved every piece of data they had into the graph. And needless to say, he had to leave the company. <laughs> Came to work for us, but he uh, is an early proponent of don't put everything in there. Just put what you need to put in there. So use the right tool for the job. It's not necessarily a tool to store transactions in. It's for a particular purpose. It's for the traversal of data and the understanding of relationships. So I'd like to share some of our mistakes, because mistakes are for learning, not repeating. <laughs> Um, when you first started down this path and we wanted to use this new innovative tool and it's taking data and yet restoring it again, we got a lot of pushback. So it costs more money. Um, why are you duplicating our data? And so we had to find a sponsor that was willing to take risk. And once we were able to demonstrate the business value early on, then the business really got on board. But we wouldn't have been able to do that if we couldn't convince um, someone in our management that this was an investment worth taking. Uh, as I mentioned before, do not model your data based on the data. Relational databases store constraints, not relationships. You don't want to just look at the data. You need to go talk to the business to understand what the data means to them and how it relates to them. Maybe stored in a database, maybe stored in, most likely on somebody's Excel spreadsheet on their desktop, or maybe in Excel. So you need to go talk to them and try to extract that knowledge from their heads and get that over in the database. Um, like I mentioned, to only store the minimal amount of data necessary to traverse these relationships or answer these questions. So polyglot persistence is the key for us. Uh, and make sure you understand what you're trying to do with it uh, as you model it. That's key. There, it's a schemaless database, so don't be afraid to throw the whole thing away. As long as you are, have good processes for ETL and you have everything scripted up, um, it's pretty easy to recover. That was our experience too when um, we first started using Neo4j and of course we knew everything because we have developed databases forever. Uh, we decided, hey, this is pretty different. Let's go get some training. After we got some training, we realized 
well, maybe we don't know exactly what we're doing. Let's get somebody to come in and maybe give us some advice. And uh, he, our, our favorite Neo4j contractor came in, gave us some advice to throw the whole thing away, <laughs> start over. And so, and since then, we've done that several times. If we're going down the wrong path, as long as we are careful to preserve everything and scripts and good ETL, it's easy to dump and reload. And more and more with the onset of clouds, it's easy just to get rid of the whole thing and start over. Uh, so today we take a very careful, thoughtful approach to building our graph. Like, so we don't try to bo boil an ocean or have two different groups with different perspectives in the same design meetings. Let's talk to the finance guy and see how they uh, view the data. Now let's go talk to this planning guys and see how they view it. Like I said, very often repeating the data, but the meanings are very different to them and their relationship. My favorite analogy coming from that same contractor is the Donner Party versus Lewis and Clark. So if you're familiar with the Donner Party, they went it alone, ended up in the mountains in the winter, ended up eating each other. It all went very poorly. Lewis and Clark went and got a guide. They were able to record and carefully map everything they did. Everything turned out really well. Lewis and Clark got really famous, changed the West. They were able to take full credit. So take the Lewis and Clark approach and not the Donner Party approach. Hmm. So again, um, I, my advice to you is seek guidance. So do your analysis. This is not your grandmother's database. And I know I'm a grandmother and I've built many databases. This is very different. Do your analysis. Talk to people. Find out uh, how it's different, what their approaches are. And if you need to, go get the help of an expert. It's highly recommended. So that's all I have for you today. I'm happy to address questions after the conference. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.